let's um, resume uh, the meeting. Um, I think what we're going to do, I'm, I know what we're going to do now, is that we're going to move on to the COVID-19 vaccines um, with an introduction by uh, Dr. Beth Bell. Uh, Dr. Bell, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, welcome to the um, COVID-19 vaccine session. Next. There are a number of considerations um, about COVID-19 vaccination in the United States that uh, form the foundation for um, our work uh, at the, in the ACIP working group. First is the recognition of um, the need uh, for equitable access to safe and effective vaccines and evidence-based uh, vaccination policy. Um, as part of that, preparing for implementation of safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines is a critical next step to protect the public and reduce the impact of COVID-19 on society. The increased risk of severe COVID-19 in vulnerable populations and racial ethnic minority groups highlight the need for diverse representation in clinical trials and for uh, ensuring equitable access to vaccines regardless of the specific vaccination strategy or identified priority groups. So the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup was established to help inform evidence-based approaches to COVID-19 vaccination policy. Next. The workgroup was established in April of 2020 and has met either weekly or biweekly since then. Our role is the collection, analysis, and preparation of information related to COVID-19 vaccines for presentation, discussion, deliberation, and vote by the ACIP using an open and transparent process. The membership of the work group um, includes 41 people, including ACIP voting members, liaisons, ex officios, and expert consultants. Next. Uh, here is just a, a very uh, exhaustive list of uh, the expertise um, of the COVID-19 workgroup members, which, as can be seen from this list, is extremely broad and ranges from epidemiology, vaccinology, infectious diseases, um, through vaccine administration and delivery and implementation issues, surveillance, ethics, health equity, and a number of other important areas. Next. So the work group is composed of four ACIP voting members, consultants in the areas of vaccinology, microbiology and immunology, safety, ethics, and health equity. In the center of this slide, you'll see the logos for, for the uh, liaison representatives um, on the work group. Um, which um, is a broad range of uh, organizations from a number of different uh, spheres. There are ex officio uh, and government members um, from the government agencies shown at the right side of the slide, and CDC par participants, including the CDC co-leads, Kathleen Dooling and Sarah Mbei. Next. One of the first um, tasks that we undertook uh, in the work group was to develop terms of reference and I've summarized them here. The policy topic under consideration by the work group is use of COVID-19 vaccines in the US population. The work group activities include reviewing the safety and immunogenicity data for COVID-19 vaccines, reviewing the epidemiology of COVID-19 disease and identifying potential target populations for vaccination, discussing potential vaccine prioritization plans in the event of insufficient early COVID-19 vaccine supply, identifying areas where additional data are needed to inform COVID-19 vaccine recommendations and developing COVID-19 vaccine policy options that ACIP may consider for recommendation. Now, as we were considering the terms of reference, we uh, decided to establish a vaccine safety technical subgroup in recognition of the importance of vaccine safety and the highly technical nature of the data that will be uh, incoming. So this uh, vaccine safety technical subgroup advises the main work group on the safety of COVID-19 vaccines, both during clinical development and post license licensure. Next.
I wanted to um, just take a moment to uh, comment on the um, factors and issues related to decision making in the context of many unknowns and uncertainties that um, we have been um, dealing with in the work group. The first is that we stick for the principles of evidence based decision making, equity, and transparency in the process. We recognize the tension between the need to provide guidance and the limited available science base. We strive to develop a robust understanding of what is known and make sure that diverse voices are heard in this process. We make decisions based on the knowns at the time while recognizing from the start that revisions will be needed as more information becomes available. This means that we uh, have to advocate for implementation of the essential strategies and systems to ensure that pivotal data for decision-making get collected. And we strive to continue to promote a feedback loop to evaluate the impact of recommendations and commit to revising accordingly. Next. Uh, so this slide um, shows the uh, members of the work uh, in the categories that uh, I've outlined previously. The ACIP members, in addition to myself, include uh, Drs. Grace Lee, Jose Romero, and Kip Talbot. Um, you can also see the names of our liaisons, ex-officio members, CDC co-leads, and um, our consultants, including Ed Belanja on safety, Matthew Daly, also safety, Kathy Kinlaw, Dana Matthew, Kathleen Newsel in vaccinology, and Stanley Perlman. Next. Uh, these are the CDC participants, um, not an exhaustive list, mind you, but a very preeminent group whose input we appreciate. Next. Thank you. Today's agenda will include um, a presentation by Dr. Matthew Hepburn, who is the lead uh, in the vaccine area of Operation Warp Speed. He'll be talking about COVID-19 vaccine development. Then we'll have Dr. Kathy Newsel from the University of Maryland discussing the landscape of COVID-19 vaccines in development. After a short break, we'll hear from Dr. Sarah Mbeyi, one of the CDC leads, about our efforts uh, in the area of COVID-19 vaccine prioritization considerations. And finally, from Dr. Kathleen Dooley, the other CDC co-lead on uh, ongoing work group considerations and next steps. Thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thank you for that introduction, uh, Dr. Bell. Um, so uh, now I will turn it over to Dr. Matthew Hepburn, who will discuss COVID-19 vaccine development. Dr. Hepburn, please. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. This is Matt Hepburn. Just doing a quick check. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. All right. Very good. Technology. <laughs> it's always the first step in one of these meetings. So um, it's certainly a privilege to uh, share at least a few minutes of time with you um, with the uh, ACIP. And um, what I'd like to do is just kind of make three general points. Um, I don't have any slides available yet. Um, part of that is uh, because we're still a work in progress and um, still uh, f figuring out sort of how we work together. And I'll, and I'll explain that as we go. Um, but also as uh, those that work in the government can certainly attest, um, we're still figuring out our own clearance process for uh, messages that can be available publicly and materials and all of that. So I think that's uh, my first theme is, is that um, the Operation Warp Speed as, as, as a group or as an entity is, um, may have been in sort of, uh, coming together over the past month or so, but it feels like we're kind of a brand new organization. And as such, um, certainly ask for, uh, both, uh, your latitude a little bit in terms of my, um, lack of ability to provide a lot of specifics about what we're doing. Um, but also an invitation to, um, that we want to engage and talk and discuss um, what we're doing uh, with ACIP as an entity, but also with um, you know the experts that are part of this phone, a part of this phone call, and part of this dialogue today. Um, I I think I, I wanted to so so with this understanding that we are a work in progress. Um, 
I do want to explain a couple things. I think the first is uh, to talk through a little bit about our organizational structure and kind of how we've come about. And then second, some of the different conceptual themes of sort of, I guess I would say, what, what we sort of a compare contrast, what we are um, and, and what we're not. Um, so to start with, um, uh, you know, Operation Warp Speed, there was this, this newly formed entity. Um, we certainly read uh, a lot in the, the public media and the press, which I think are uh, unfortunately misconceptions. Um, and I think um, we'll have a chance to uh, get that message out to, public, to publicly to dispel some of those misconceptions and those notions in the coming days and weeks. Um, but for for the purpose of this call, I think it's helpful to note that um, I see it really as an integration of some of the best efforts in our U.S. government um, and uh, resources available um, to accelerate a few products um, so that we can have a, a safe and effective vaccine uh, to respond to this pandemic. I'm happy to be a little bit more specific. I am an infectious diseases physician who served 23 years as an active duty Army officer and retired and uh, ran uh, some of our rapid vaccine and antibody development programs in Department of Defense and then was asked to be part of Operation Warp Speed as our Department of Defense and Health and Human Services integrated effort. And I think if that, one of the key take-home points is that you know, it's we're not this secret organization that's we're working, uh, you know, with unknown people and unknown. No, no one really understands what we're doing. I really do think it's just the opposite. We're taking advantage of uh, the best in terms of expertise and capability within both Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense. Um, it is nice because we actually are integrated, and I think most of you can appreciate that. One of the things our federal government often struggles with is our ability to integrate across the different departments and agencies. Um, I think Operation Warp Speed is a, is a case in point, frankly, on, on how we can and should integrate. Uh, and I, I'm happy to be more specific on that. Um, as part of our vaccine team, um, we have uh, essentially each of the vaccines uh, that we're planning to engage with um, has a product team that's composed of about 10 or 12 individuals. Um, those individuals are really drawn throughout uh, Health and Human Services and Department of Defense, including NIH and CDC, um, with, a, with a significant component from our, our colleagues at HHS BARDA, especially on the contracting and program management side of things. Um, but we also have functional leads. Um, our first functional lead that cuts across all of our products. Um, the first group is in the preclinical and clinical space. Um, this is chaired by John Mascola well, over at the Vaccine Research Center um, and really populated uh, with um, really what I think are some of the best scientists in our government, uh, clearly from the National Institute of Health, also from the, the Department of Defense and, and elsewhere. Um, our second cross-functional area is in manufacturing, um, again, taking advantage of mostly from HHS BARDA, but the best in government um, to look at this. And third uh, is led by Nancy Messonnier, who's uh, I'm, I'm almost certain is on the phone today, um, who leads a really remarkable team um, in the distribution and administration category. And so it, it, I, I like how we've, so, we really have put this together in the past two to three weeks. And frankly, I like how uh, we're working very well together. But I hope you can appreciate, the, frankly, the advantage of um, taking a lot of these different components in our government, um, putting to, putting them together for um, this common focus. Now, um, you know, Operation Warp Speed. We can argue about the name and the, you know, how they you know, it may lend itself to misconceptions. I don't, I don't think that's the point of this conversation. Um, but why, frankly, I'm very excited about this is that it does uh, entail. Uh, p putting significant resources um, for multiple vaccines to be developed and to be developed on an accelerated schedule. One of the key points that we make when we talk about acceleration um, is that this is not acceleration in terms of cutting corners. This is not acceleration in terms of compromising safety standards. Rather, we're looking at ac accelerating uh, where we might otherwise do things in parallel uh, because of resources and financial risk. So, for example, one of our main goals 
is to make sure that we can manufacture at scale. Um, and I think everybody appreciates that that one of the key components of manufacturing at scale is you got to start early. So in a typical vaccine development product development pipeline, you might hit some of your larger scale runs um, after you have more proof of concept data. Um, in this case, we said we're going to take more financial risk and start larger scale manufacturing operations earlier. I think it's a really good example of um, that that approach, you know, we may have a few vaccines where we make a lot of doses of those vaccines and those vaccines may not pan out in clinical trials. That's, you know, that's lost financial resources, but that really doesn't compromise the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. So I, I think, you know, my my second point is that, you know, we are following um, that the, the product development expectations um, that you would expect. What that will mean is, and, and unfortunately, I'm not going to go into details in terms of which products we are funding, which products we are not funding. Um, I will say that um, what we have done broadly is looked at what some of the different um, funding sources and re resources across the U.S. government um, we haven't said to cut things to be part of this program or said, you know, there's no, you know, big selection list where a few get picked and the ones that don't get get picked, uh, get cut and they don't get any U.S. government funding anymore. But rather, we are going through a process, really a continuous uh, assessment process of which vaccines we think are most promising um, to deliver significant doses. Um, within by the end of the calendar year 2020 or within the first quarter to half of 2021 and looking at different ways that we can accelerate those. Um, one of the big things that's coming up soon um, that our NIH colleagues in particular uh, have been working on quite a bit, and I know some of them are on the phone, is thinking through uh, the large-scale clinical trials that would be associated with this. Um, these are going to be individualized and case by case. Um, but one of the things that most of the members have probably seen is a, a science article uh, by Larry Corey and John Mascola and Tony Fauci recently um, that really advocated for harmonization uh, wherever possible uh, with vaccine clinic, especially for the large scale phase three vaccine clinical efficacy trials. Um, that is our intention, and that, again, I think our colleagues at the NIH are really well positioned uh, to take an active role in that. Further, uh, we are aiming to um, uh, partner with our NIH clinical trials networks um, where it makes sense, and not necessarily exclusively, to keep the large phase three, you know, to, to be partners in the, the some of these large phase three clinical trials, which we anticipate will be coming up in the coming months. Finally, um, where our CDC colleagues have really been absolutely critical in playing a leadership role is that, uh, you know, and of course, fingers crossed, <laughs> but uh, if we are uh, in a scenario uh, where we do have a safe and effective vaccine um, and that vaccine is ready for distribution, uh, working through um, all of the complexities, um, all of the complexities and challenges uh, with distributing that vaccine. Um, where, you know, I think a very fair question from ACIP would be, well, how far along are we in that process? And uh, we can certainly defer to Nancy and the CDC to comment further. Um, but I think from a Operation Warp Speed standpoint, um, in our first few weeks, we've really focused on the earlier product development and making some of those important decisions to get, to, to, if you will, to accelerate the product development pipeline. Um, we do have an eye towards how would this be, how would these vaccines be distributed based on their indication, which populations would benefit most from vaccination? Where would we anticipate side effects? So all of those. Uh, complex issues, which you on the phone are much more expert at than I am. Um, those are critical issues that need to be addressed, and uh, our intention is to address those in the coming weeks. But as we address those challenges, as was outlined in the in the previous conversation, and I think will be talked about throughout the day, um, we need your help. 
And, uh, you know, I, I, the, I think hopefully I've made clear to you that we're really leveraging a lot of the expertise in the U.S. government. And you know these people, they're your colleagues, and um, they're, part of, they're part of our team, but you can talk to them every day. But I think more formally, from an Operation Warp Speed standpoint, we sincerely welcome uh, the dialogue, the input, and the future conversations with ACIP. Um, I'm happy to field questions. I'll also stay on the line as long as I can. I do have another meeting coming up fairly soon, but uh, I'll stay on for as much of this panel as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hepburn, for those uh, like overview and, and for your comments. Um, uh, we look forward to working with you um, as we move forward on the COVID vaccine uh, issue and development. Um, We'll open it up now for questions. Um, I will take uh, Chair's prerogative and ask the first question, and that is, um, how does Operation Warp Speed see the role of the ACIP in determining uh, risk populations um, and uh, making recommendations for distribution of available vaccines coming uh, forward in the future? Um, as you know, we have uh, almost a 60-year experience um, in uh, making recommendations regarding the use of vaccine uh, for the control and prevention of disease here in the United States. So uh, if you could address that. Absolutely. I mean, simply put, we, we see your role as essential and um, essential in helping us think through the challenges, uh, essential for your, your input, your advice, your expertise. Um, I, I guess one of the things I would add is, is that sort of, for me personally, I'm happy to engage with ACIP as frequently as needed. Um, I'm, I'm, I, because of your close relationship with the expertise at the CDC, um, I'm also uh, making the assumption, but I think it's a very valid assumption, that that dialogue, as you've already outlined, occurs, you know, you, you're, informing, um, you're informing our team through the dialogue that you have with the CDC on a very routine and informal basis, but we're happy to include include you where it's appropriate, ask for your advice. Um, I think in terms of right now, as you can appreciate, we're we're still in some of the we're still in the early stages for these vaccines. Um, but if we are successful with resources to accelerate the timelines on these, then in the coming you know weeks and months, um, you know, we're going to welcome the dialogue once we have a little bit more understanding of how these products work um, and a little bit more understanding of, okay, which products do we actually think um, may be able to achieve uh, emergency use authorization as example. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, Dr. Hepburn, this is uh, Amanda Cohen. I just want to um, thank you and just clarify one um, point you just made, which is that um, all of our discussions between ACIP and CDC occur in this public um, open setting, and um, we only have these formal meetings. Um, and I just want to make sure the audience um, understood that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. But again, I think this, this is a great forum to dialogue for us to hear. We're happy to share information and let you know what we're doing. Um, but also be inspired by uh, your input, suggestion, and guidance. Thank you. Uh, I believe Dr. Talbot uh, was next for questions. Dr. Talbot? You're unmuted, Dr. Talbot. Should we move to Dr. Fry while we wait for Dr. Talbot to get on? I, I think that is fine. Yes, Dr. Fry, please. Sorry, that was muted again. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was um, good to hear. Uh, as we know, a lot of the timelines are being compressed with these phase three studies. And uh, who who makes the final decision, or how is the final decision uh, made? Um, and at what point when do you decide to launch a vaccine, uh, or say that it's efficacious and uh, launch the vaccine in such a way that it, it 
uh, being, it's already being manufactured, presumably, but but will then go on to the market. How do you work with the FDA and others to decide that this is the one? Yeah. It- no, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. And, and let me answer it in two parts. I think the first part will be uh, just to uh, st- state this hopefully very clearly. Um, that in terms of the product development that would be expected for this, that we're going to follow that process for which vaccine product development usually follows. And what I mean by that is is that uh, the the clinical trials process, um, the manufacturing, under good manufacturing practices process, all of those things that you would normally expect for any vaccine development, there's no, you know, we're going to do all of those. There, that, you know, that is the expectation, and that will include frequent dialogue with the FDA at every at every step where it is appropriate. And ultimately, if there is a situation where, you know, the, the safety and efficacy is good enough um, to apply for emergency use authorization. Now, our role is to fund the company. So, so the the vaccine development companies uh, under contracts will receive resources to to do a lot of these functions. This is, you know, again in the Department of Defense when we fund a vaccine project, we fund the company they do they do this. Um HHS BARDA, it's the same thing. So so we're funding the company to do that and, you know, they're responsible for many of these steps in product development. Um what I'm excited about is that again by leveraging the expertise in our government as we think about the clinical trials and the clinical trial design and you know running these clinical trials at sites, we've just gotten a lot of we, – we can leverage, like I said previously, we can leverage all of that expertise from the National Institute of Health and the CDC and BARDA and these different places um, to ensure that we have – not just a clinical trial run by um, a vaccine company, but a very high quality clinical trial, a clinical trial that has harmonization, meaning you have common endpoints. So that may get us um, an opportunity to look at different vaccines to have some comparability. It also allows us to really leverage um, trying to answer these critical scientific questions, um, such as correlates of protection. And so um, I, I hope that kind of answers your question, though, in terms of that, you know, again, it's resources through contracts to drive a vaccine process that will follow those typical steps. But in that program management and leveraging our U.S. government team, um, I think we can not only accelerate products, but we can actually learn a lot, too, about those products. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next uh uh, speaker will be uh, Dr. Uh, Thorin Fink, the FDA. Would you like to make comments? Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to reiterate something very important that that um, Dr. Heplin said, which is that um, in the clinical development of all of these COVID vaccine candidates, FDA will uh, continue to perform independent review and, and oversight of the, the development process and will make the the, the final determination based on the data available um, as to the, the safety and appropriateness of, of any progression in, in clinical development and um, and providing the vaccine uh, either in the context of, of a clinical study, whether it's uh, first in human study or advancing to uh, phase three efficacy studies and also wider availability of, of vaccine candidates. Uh, either through licensure or some other mechanism. Thank you. Um, I believe Dr. Talbot has uh, overcome her um, electronic difficulty. Go ahead, Dr. Talbot. I just got so excited I couldn't help it. Um, So as an adult immunologist, vaccinologist, this is incredibly exciting, and I am looking forward to all the collaboration that's ongoing. I'm also very excited because this gives us some time to prepare um, as we wait for data And uh, one of the things that I would like to point out as someone who does viral respiratory disease surveillance and vaccine effectiveness is we don't have a very good way of tracking immunizations of adults in the United States. Um, The state registries vary greatly. Um, And I think one of the things that can be done in preparation for this new vaccine or vaccines is that we strengthen and enhance our state registries 
so that adult data can flow into them. And then as time goes, we can provide real-time vaccine effectiveness and safety data um, much more quickly and thoroughly than we would be able to at this time. So, so this is this is Matt Hepburn. I first say, Dr. Talbot, I'm a huge fan of your work, by the way. <laughs> and I've heard you speak a lot of times before. So good to have you on the phone. Appreciate your comments um, and, uh, and completely agree. Um, I, again, I think you can recognize the the benefit of, of us in this integrated approach, having the, the CDC on our team and, and part of this entire process. And so um, I w- what you have said is what I've heard from them. I certainly defer to their expertise in terms of the how, um, I, but I couldn't agree more that this is an opportunity um, for us to, if you, you know, for try to be too colloquial, but to do this right and to say, okay, if we can get to a point and, and not minimizing the challenges. There are enormous challenges. Everybody on the phone understands enormous challenges in in um, developing a vaccine against this virus. But if we are successful, you know, now is the time to think through those latter phases in terms of distribution and tracking, as you have correctly pointed out. And so we appreciate your comment. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Finley. Hi, this is Christine Finley with the Association of Immunization Managers. I want to thank you for taking time to provide the information. And one thing you said that caught my attention was integration of the best efforts in government. And I really would like to encourage you to build on the existing plans and infrastructure we have. In working with CDC, you're probably aware that we have 67 immunization awardees that address everything from enrolling um, providers to distributing vaccine directly to them, overseeing the storage and handling, and working with the immunization information systems. Many of us have worked through 2009, but um, we're working closely with CDC, so I just want to encourage building on effective Mm -hmm. systems that have been developed. So this is Matt Hepburn, and and agree. Uh, 100% agree and and appreciate your comments. I think... um, I think all of us can certainly appreciate that you know that the what's going to happen this fall is is inherently unpredictable in and of itself and in terms of the effectiveness of our vaccine and sort of how effective will will it be or will multiple vaccines i mean wouldn't it be great if we have some choices and, op- and options? Um, but how effective will they be and how effective will they be in what populations and what types of scenarios? And uh, uh, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of complexity right now. But I think the only the only thing that's certain is uncertainty. And what I mean by that is, is I think we're going to have to plan ahead, but also be very flexible and say, um, we need to utilize the expertise and the mechanisms for vaccine distribution that we currently have, but also say, how can how can we pivot and be flexible? How can we um, respond to the unique scenarios that we might find ourselves in? Um, and uh, again, to go back to the previous comment, vaccine tracking would be a good example, but um, I think there are many others. So we will rely on your expertise to inform us in terms of the best way to get this done. Dr. Lee. Uh, Dr. Hepburn, thank you so much for um, joining us today. We really appreciate it and hope that this continues to be this real-time connection, particularly as we continue to uh, review evidence in real time as it continues to emerge. So um, this particular Mm -hmm. process gives us the opportunity to um, have this openness and transparency about the process around Um, Mm decision-making. Given the sort of critical nature of uh, COVID vaccines, (laughs) Um, in general to the um, health and welfare of our populations, but also just, I see this particular vaccine as being so critical to ensuring that we can maintain uh, public trust and engagement in immunizations in general. Um, Mm -hmm. I I really echo a couple of points that were made earlier and hope that um, this might be an opportunity for early engagement and partnership. Um, One being in the pre-distribution phase, knowing that, you know, certain vaccines might be targeted for certain populations because of their benefit risk profile, um, that it would be extremely helpful to think about targeted educational and engagement efforts with those priority populations 
in the pre-distribution phase. So getting getting to that population beforehand and making sure we're um, working those, with those populations and preparing them for you know the benefits and risks of uh, COVID vaccination and weighing that against disease. Um, and even more critical, I think, and and um, something that I think is inc incredibly important is to ensure in the post-distribution phase um, uh, that we are being able, that we are able to track because vaccine safety surveillance in that post-distribution phase will be critical to continuing to uh, inform our decisions in real time. And I anticipate we'll have to adapt as we go, as you say, because there are so many uncertainties now, um, but being able to tie that in uh, and link that more tightly between um, distribution, tracking, monitoring, and particularly who's getting the vaccine in terms of risk populations, you know, occupational risk exposure, age, all of that would be incredibly helpful for us as we're monitoring vaccine safety after distribution occurs. Any comments you have on that would be wonderful. Yeah, uh, well, I, it, this is the, Matt Hepburn again, and I don't have a lot to add. <laughs> I 100% agree. I think uh, I think it's great. I think you're raising those points. I think um, again, I feel like um, you know it's a privilege to be part of a U.S. government team that includes the CDC that has a lot of experience. You know experience and thoughtfulness in terms of to how to accomplish that mission, leveraging um, experience from lots of other issues and, and, fr and frankly, just incredible challenges in, in communicating effectively um, about vaccines. I do, I think some of the tenets that we've talked about in this conversation today, tenets of transparency, tenets of um, ensuring that, and hopefully my message has been clear today, that we're going to go through the processes of of product development to ensure the vaccine safe and effective. And I, again, I'm glad my FDA colleague was able to chime in to make that clear in terms of their independence in the review process. We we have to do a better job of communicating that. I mean, we as a as an institution, I would say, um, but I I think we will, and we'll certainly value your help in this. Um, I think one of the things that I would ask. ACIP and the people on the phone, um, as well as our, our government team, too, is just to um, certainly learn the lessons of the past in terms of how we communicate about vaccines, but also, you know, if we can think about how how to stay, if you will, um, one step ahead of the misinformation. Um, I'm not an expert at communication, so I'm going to rely on others to be able to to be thoughtful about that. Um, but, you know, we, we anticipate there's going to be lots of misinformation and how deleterious that can be. Um, I, I just, you know, I want us to collectively, let's be creative about how we stay one step ahead of it. Um, but I agree, sort of clear communication and transparency is a great first step. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Dr. Dr. Bell, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just uh, wanted to kind of take the opportunity, this opportunity to just reiterate a few of the points that have been made. Um, I'm very happy to see and hear that um, we are sharing some, we have so many principles in common of transparency and of integration and um, of um, using science, uh, sort of science-based uh, policy. Um, just to re re sort of reiterate that the ACIP, that we are all uh, experts that have been appointed by the HHS secretary. The, H the ACIP has been in existence for decades and decades. And we've, um, you know, Dr. Hepburn, you're mentioning that the Operation Warp Speed is a, is a new organization. And um, we really stand ready to uh, help you in your efforts. Uh, we all do need to work together to succeed. The ACIP has developed a very well oiled, and um, highly respected process for taking uh, scientific information as it becomes available and using it to develop policies um, that are evidence-based that look to have the largest impact in terms of uh, preventing morbidity and mortality and reducing spread and which are designed to uh, strengthen and continue um, to inspire confidence of the public in um, the way that we make decisions about vaccination policy in the United States. So as chair of the work group, I, I uh, sort of um, invite you to engage with us early and often. Um, we feel like we uh, have a, a quite an important role to play 
and that we can help with many aspects of this uh, process um, as, um, as it uh, develops. So, so this is Matt, and again, yeah, greatly appreciate your comments. Greatly appreciate your comments, and um, certainly all in favor of continuing the dialogue. Just let me know. Thank you all. Um, I think we'll move on then to the uh, next presenter, Dr. Newsel, um, who will be talking about the landscape of candidate uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Dr. Newsel, please. Thanks everybody and, and good afternoon. I'm, I'm happy to present today on the vaccine landscape for COVID. I think this will follow nicely to many of the prior discussions, particularly John and Natalie's really um, beautiful in, introduction of the virus and immunology should make this go faster and let me concentrate more on the vaccine. As I said, John and Natalie gave a great introduction to the target, which is SARS-CoV-2. I'll talk a little bit about the complexity of vaccine development and then quickly run through some of the vaccine platforms and attributes, the candidates in development, and just mention the upcoming trial. So again, you've heard a lot about this pathogen and immunity, and particularly the importance of that spike glycoprotein or the S protein. And what do we know and what are some vaccine development lessons from other coronavirus? So we know if we look at some sequence comparisons, the MERS spike S protein is about 30% homologous to SARS-CoV-2, the SARS spike S protein is about 80% homologous. We know both of those prior coronaviruses had good vaccine responses to several constructs in animals. There were vaccines that made it to phase one human trials for both SARS and MERS. They showed broadly neutralizing antibody. The MERS vaccine development continued Continues, and unfortunately, SARS investments were, were reallocated. So we did not get very far with SARS vaccine development. Now, again, you've heard about this SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and its importance in viral entry. So everything that you heard from Natalie about immunity are exactly what makes this spike protein a target for vaccine development. And she very nicely explained the characteristics of this protein, so I won't go through that again. I will say, however, in the context of vaccine development, you will hear a lot about the type of spike protein that's used, if it's the full-length protein, if it's the receptor binding domain, if it's the pre-fusion or post-fusion form, and I'll say something about that in a minute. And similarly, a lot of her explanations of why we use certain antibody tests is also relevant to vaccine development. So this protein is um, a metastable protein. It undergoes this major structural rearrangement to be able to fuse the viral membrane with the host cell membrane. So we are trying with vaccines to get antibody to disrupt that binding. And again, some people are using the um, wild type confirmation, but there's also been, and you heard about this, this pre-fusion confirmation and this stabilization of the pre-fusion form of the spike protein described by investigators at the VRC at NIH, where they inserted these two stabilizing proline mutations that have been effective for other beta coronaviruses. So again, when you hear about a pre-fusion stabilized protein used in a vaccine, this is your resource. So again, Natalie set this up quite nicely about what do we know about immunity in humans. And, and certainly we try to parrot vaccine development on what works with natural infection. And unfortunately, we don't know a lot. So just to emphasize a couple of her points that I think are relevant to vaccine development. 
There is an immune response post-infection. We do see neutralizing responses post-infection. They don't cross-react with the SARS virus. What we don't know that would be helpful to vaccine development is we don't know the level of antibody needed to prevent reinfection. We don't know the duration of protection from natural immunity, and we don't yet know how important T-cell immunity is to either prevent infection or reinfection. Now, we do have some hints from animal models, and in fact, there are two uh, NHP models in rhesus macaques that do show if you infect rhesus, rhesus macaques and then come back and attempt to reinfect, that initial infection does protect against rechallenge. So this is a positive for developing a vaccine. However, we know that these experiments are done with relatively small numbers of, of animals. And we also know that this re-challenge was done fairly close in time to the initial challenge, 28 days in one of these and 35 days in the other. So I would say this is still an unanswered question, but animal models are supportive. So let's now turn to vaccine development. And we know that vaccine development is, is a lengthy, risky, and expensive process. And many of you have heard that generally an accelerated timeline might mean six or seven years from the usual 15 to 20 year timeline. But let me emphasize what Matt also emphasized. We are compressing these timelines with investments in finances, investments in resources, with at-risk manufacturing and other at-risk choices. We are not compromising in terms of safety. We are not compromising in terms of safety follow-up. Nonetheless, um, a, a 12 to 18 month timeline, which is one um, target being put out there for these COVID vaccines, would represent a, a quite rapid timeline from, again, initial identification of, of the organism almost to vaccine development. So let's take a look at vaccine platforms and attributes. And I adapted this from that same New England Journal paper that showed the, the prior diagram. And I think this is really an important table to consider. One of the most frequent questions I get, and if you look here, and I'm not sure if, if my arrow shows or not, you see that all of the licensed platforms, meaning that they, this platform is licensed for another vaccine target, are also slower to initially make. And so when people say to me, why is it the unproven technologies that the government is currently testing, it's because they have the advantage of speed of manufacture. And be assured that these, these tried and true licensed platforms will be coming along in the next months and will also be tested. That being said, I will also emphasize that the reason that these new platforms have not been licensed does not necessarily mean that these new platforms don't work, and I'll show you in a minute why that might be true. We know that this is a scientific endeavor, but we also know that vaccine development is, is business-driven and market-driven. So many of these DNA and RNA vaccines have either been used for emerging infections, where the market then went away, and the SARS is a good example where vaccine development was, was stopped and those investments were reallocated to something else. Or perhaps for a vaccine such as influenza, where there is a quite competitive market, and would a new vaccine be able to compete in the market? So the fact that we don't have a licensed platform yet should really not imply that again, these are inferior vaccines that couldn't be safe, couldn't be immunogenic, and, and couldn't be effective. If we look at the dose, you know, clearly in an outbreak situation, a, a single dose would be nice. It, it's 
highly unlikely in a naive population for most of these platforms that we will see efficacy after a single dose. But again, um, perhaps we will. We predict that most of these platforms will require multiple doses. And then when we look at scale, this is also important. Again, this is a pandemic. We have 320 million people in the U.S. We have 8 billion people in the world. If each of them need two vaccines, you can see very quickly that we would like platforms that are able to be scaled. And, and quite frankly, we want multiple wins. You know, we would like to see three or four or five licensed vaccines on the market in a short time frame. So if we look here, this just gives you an idea again at the breadth and, and really the number of vaccines that are in development right now, according to many different platforms, which as I've just shown you, have different advantages and disadvantages in terms of speed and scale. So let's take a look at some of the COVID-19 vaccine candidates that are in clinical development. And one of the furthest along is this non-replicating viral vector, which is in a phase one slash two, really slash three study um, in the UK. This is a, a, a chimp adeno vaccine, and there were similar platforms, small numbers of, of, of people in these trials, but for MERS, for influenza, for TB, for chikungunya, and, and for Zika vaccine. So again, this is in, in development in the UK and will enter clinical trials in the US, hopefully in, in the next uh, month and a half or so. There's also a, a non-replicating viral vector based on an uh, adenovirus type 5 by a, a, a Chinese manufacturer that has entered phase 2, and I'll show you some phase 1 data. The first clinical trial in the United States was with, um, actually the second clinical trial in the United States, the first was a DNA vaccine, was this mRNA vaccine by Moderna which again, we've never seen a licensed platform with the mRNA vaccines, but we have seen these, these platforms used for influenza, Zika, chikungunya. Um, Novavax has a protein subunit vaccine and that started phase one testing in Australia. Again, Pfizer in collaboration with, with BioNTech has three different formulations of an mRNA vaccine currently in phase one in both in the U.S. and Europe. There's a DNA vaccine by Anovio, and then multiple Chinese developers have inactivated vaccines, plus or minus alum, in phase one, two development. But again, in the U.S., we would expect to see relatively soon uh, a chimp adeno, certainly the mRNA, which is already in phase one and, and, and actually already in phase two and heading towards phase three, the protein subunit vaccine and a DNA vaccine are all in testing in the United States. So just to say a little bit about these nucleic acid vaccines, again, one reason why they can make it to clinic a, a lot faster is what we need is the genetic sequence. And that then that genetic sequence can just be substituted for whatever genetic sequence was in the prior formulation of the vaccine. So a, a COVID RNA replaces an influenza RNA. And so again, there's no fermentation required. There's no optimizing cell cultures required. These can move very quickly. Now, a, a DNA vaccine has to make it to the nucleus of the cell and needs a little help with that, which is why we use either a process called, you know, electroporation or we use devices to deliver these DNA vaccines. Similarly, RNA vaccines only need to make it into the cytoplasm, but they're encased in a lipid coat, which does help them to enter cells. And, and again, this is the genetic material, and then our own myocytes make the viral proteins, and then our body makes the immune response. 
So this Moderna vaccine, I only have a press release to show you the results. I hope very soon we expect to have uh, a peer-reviewed publication with these results. But this phase one started in, in healthy adults, 18 to 55 in March. We do know, as announced on May 18th, that after two doses, all participate Participants evaluated at the 25 microgram and 100 microgram dose cohorts did seroconvert with binding antibody. And because, as I emphasized, we don't have a level of binding antibody that we know is protective, what's being done in these trials is they're being compared to convalescent sera. And as you heard from Natalie, you know, the convalescent sera can, can be quite um, diverse in the responses. Um, nonetheless, these participants had binding antibody levels at or above the level seen in convalescent sera. Similarly, neutralizing antibody titers, so the ability to, to stop the growth and spread of the virus, um, reached or exceeded neutralizing antibody titers seen in convalescent sera from patients who had recovered from COVID. These vaccines were generally safe and, and well tolerated, provided full protection against viral replication in a mouse um, challenge model. And we anticipate, again, this is under phase two testing, that phase three will begin in July. Now, the, the second vaccine for which I have some data are the viral vector vaccines. And again, this is another example where these are gene-based vaccines. A protein does not need to be made. And so these can be manufactured faster and get into clinics sooner. So this may either be a replicating viral vector, such as a weakened measles vaccine, for which the coronavirus spike gene is in inserted, or a non-replicating viral vector vaccine, such as the adenovirus vaccine. And again, our own myocytes then, then make the proteins, and our body um, hopefully makes an immune response. So um, this publication from Lancet um, in May discussed the safety, tolerability, and immunogenicity of a recombinant adenovirus type 5 vector vaccine. And I will quickly show you those results. Uh, here are the adverse events to this ad 5 vectored vaccine at a low dose, a middle dose, and a high dose. And you can see there was reactogenicity and particularly pain at the injection site in right about 50% or more participants uh, at all three dose levels. And, and really for um, adults, this, this is, uh, you see the, the fever here, grade, grade three fever was lower, but any fever about 40 to 50%. So there is some reactogenicity with these vaccines. There was also immunogenicity seen. And again, we see both the ELISA antibodies that, that Natalie discussed, as well as the functional neutralizing antibodies in the low, middle, and, and high dose. We see that the antibody um, peaks at, at day 28. There is a dose-dependent response for both the ELISA and the neutralizing antibodies. And as we've seen with other adenovirus vaccines, uh, a high pre-existing AD5 neutralizing antibody response did compromise the neutralizing antibody to COVID post-vaccination, regardless of vaccine dose. So this may not be true for all of the adenovirus vector vaccines, but again, this has been seen before with the AD5 vaccine. So moving along, you know, as I emphasized, and this question actually came up earlier about vaccine-enhanced illness with these trials, and again, just to emphasize that there is, is no compromise here in safety assessment. Obviously, all of these trials go through full FDA review, full ethics review, and safety is taken very seriously every step of the way. So in addition to the reactogenicity measures that, that I showed you, 
Um, there are animal studies that are being done in, in multiple animal models to look for any vaccine enhanced illness. Now, the question was asked about antibody-dependent enhancement of, of viral replication. This is something that's really been shown primarily by viruses with an innate macrophage tropism, so dengue, for example. Uh, in the case of COVID, you may be more worried about a vaccine and enhanced respiratory illness. So again, in those animal studies, what's being looked for are the inflammatory um, cytokines, a Th1 versus Th2 response, and also looking at neutralizing antibodies versus non-neutralizing antibodies. So what does this mean for our human studies? For a vaccine-enhanced respiratory illness, one might worry about that occurring a little bit later in time, you know, maybe a year or maybe two years after getting a vaccine when, when those functional neutralizing antibodies start to wane. So in all of the phase three trials, um, at least that I'm involved in um, with, with the government, these, these participants are being followed out to two years. So in summary, um, we need safe and effective vaccines, not vaccine, um, for COVID-19. I've shown you a robust pipeline of promising candidates because we do need multiple wins. We have a lot of challenges. It's, it's, it's a new disease. It's poorly understood immunity. As we plan these large phase three trials, we have an uncertain trajectory of, of the outbreak, where to go, are we gonna get the attack rates that are needed to, to show efficacy. Vaccine safety will be meticulously assessed and if an enhanced disease occurs, it will be carefully assessed and immune mechanisms will be investigated. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nuzzo, for that excellent overview. Um, which we'll open up to questions from the members, voting members. Dr. Atmar. Thank you, Dr. Newell, for a great presentation. I, I guess um, my question uh, goes towards what was discussed um, a little bit earlier and what you just uh, brought up about um, safety, it, you know, some of the safety concerns that uh, you suggested may be there may not show up until uh, a year or two after vaccination as neutralizing antibody wanes. And yet an efficacy uh, signal may well uh, be evident earlier um, at, at least for short-term protection. And as one considers uh, rolling out such, uh, uh, rolling out vaccines as expeditiously as possible, how do we balance um, early signals of potential efficacy against uh, the unknown risks of safety that may not appear uh, until later during the follow-up. I'd be interested in, in what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. Yeah, so it's a, a really great, great question. And as I said, de depending on the vaccine construct and, and for this particular disease, I, I don't know that we would expect the, the antibody-dependent enhancement based on what we know about the immunology. Likewise, as you're probably aware, you know, enhanced respiratory disease ha has been mainly seen in children and maybe partially due to the anatomy and the, and the small airways. I think nonetheless, um, because with the original SARS and MERS, you know, there, there was a lot of discrepancy in terms of some animal models showed disease enhancements and some did not. Again, this will be very carefully explored in, in animal models, and I would welcome the FDA to comment here as well. So that is one way, and again, in the interest of time, I did not show the animal models that, that have been done, but, but these are quite extensive 
studies being done in animals to look for any signal. And then to answer your second question, um, you know, it, it's all, of course, a risk-benefit ratio in terms of when we develop vaccines, when we evaluate vaccines, and when we use vaccines. And, you know, we're certainly in a pandemic right now where we're seeing unprecedented morbidity and mortality in high-risk groups and unprecedented economic consequences. And so we do have to consider the benefit side of these vaccines. Um, if there were, and it would be fantastic, I think, uh, a vaccine um, licensed sooner, uh, again, e even if we had to give that, that vaccine to the, the control groups, let's say, the, the original participants would, would still be continued to be followed. So I think it's careful assessment, and again, it's considering that, that risk-benefit ratio along the way. Thank you. I'll ask uh, Dr. Fink uh, to comment if he would. I'm, I'm happy to, to chime in. So as, as Dr. Newsel mentioned, FDA is, is looking at many uh, potential um, sources of data to inform the, the risk of enhanced respiratory disease throughout clinical development of, of COVID-19 vaccine candidates. And these sources of data include characterization of the immune response, uh, both in animal models, as well as uh, early phase clinical study participants uh, in terms of neutralizing and total antibody responses, and also Th1 versus Th2 uh, polarization as well as looking at the ability of the vaccine to protect animals uh, against a challenge in appropriate animal models, um, as well as uh, looking for uh, histopathological evidence of uh, enhanced respiratory disease uh, to the extent that uh, those, those types of studies um, are feasible and, and animals for, the, for those studies are available. Uh, and as Dr. Newsel mentioned, um, careful follow-up of clinical study subjects uh, for the long term, um, one or two years at least, will be, will be important to continue to assess vaccine safety, um, both for uh, participants in early phase studies as well as participants in, uh, in phase three efficacy trials, even if there is um, a signal for, for efficacy or, or even a, a demonstration of efficacy that would be sufficient to support wider um, distribution of, of the vaccine um, before uh, uh, longer-term follow-up uh, has, has been completed for, for all of the subjects. Thank you for those comments. Uh, Dr. Baker, please. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, great talk. I mean, really great. Um, a question that's theoretical, but you probably know what the trials in the United States are um, are doing. Is there going to be a single dose arm evaluation? Or is it all going to be two doses to start with for the vaccines that are being evaluated in the United States? Yeah, so Carol, it really depends on the vaccine. So, you know, the furthest along are the mRNA vaccines, and everything we know about mRNA vaccines will take more than, than one dose. So um, those will be two-dose vaccines. The chimp adeno vaccine that I mentioned that's being tested in the UK is being tested as a single-dose vaccine. They have some arms that are um, actually fewer subjects are getting two doses, but the majority of subjects are getting one dose. So it's possible that some of those viral vector vaccines will either be single dose or will have both a one and two dose arm as part of the trial. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Hi, uh, Dr. Newsel, thank you for an amazing talk and going through um, all the work that's being done and sharing the compressed time frame. Thinking ahead, since we're working with a compressed timeline, when you're thinking about the randomized control trials, um, there's a tension. One is you want the healthy persons to make sure you know what's going to happen, but we also know 
in COVID-19, people with obesity and other um, underlying conditions have more disease. How are we going to balance the need uh, to represent them and other age groups? Yeah, so Kathy, that's a great question and thanks for asking it because I intended to mention this during my, my talk and I just forgot. So first to know that the phase one trials and the data that I was able to show you so far were in the young and middle-aged healthy adults, but in fact, all of these phase one trials quickly expanded to older adults um, above 65, up to 85, or even higher. So, you know, people are quite aware of the epidemiology and, and where we really need to be sure that we understand where these vaccines work. So most of the clinical trials, again, I can't speak for every clinical trial, but those that I have, have been involved with are certainly in, including older age groups, are including people with chronic diseases, and in fact are targeting a, a relatively modest to high percentage of people, you know, setting, setting benchmarks for we need to get at least X percent of people in some of these high-risk categories. Dr. Shalaji. Yes, Kathy, that was a uh, really tremendous overview talk. Thank you so much. And actually, I had exactly the same question as Kathy Paling, but also um, with respect to um, what, when you think there will be trials that involve children. Um, and are there, is there any evidence from um, similar vaccines? Or do you have any sense about the different platforms that m um, might suggest whether the efficacy would vary uh, you know, across the platforms would be better in one kind of platform than another for children or older adults um, or by race and ethnicity? Yeah, it's a really good question. So um, children, yes, I can't tell you timing or plans or how quickly. Again, I can say that one of the first vaccines and the furthest ahead, the chimp adeno in Oxford already has built in plans to um, age de-escalate um, rel relatively soon. Again, I can't give you the exact timeline, but it's part of the, the, the clinical development plan. I think in, in the U.S. we have a team that likely includes many of your colleagues thinking carefully through this, how we do it, and, and preparing for these trials when we feel that it's safe to do so. In terms of the construct, it's a really good question. And again, just getting back some of these phase one data, which we don't have yet in the different age groups will be really helpful to look at the difference. You know, we know, and, and we hate to admit this, but many vaccines, you know, hepatitis um, B immunogenicity starts declining as early as in your 40s. We see it with influenza vaccine um, as, as early as in your, your 50s. So, so we know that immunosenescence is, is real. Um, again, I would look to some of the successes in, in the older population, you know, the, the higher doses of antigen, for example, that we use for influenza vaccine or the adjuvants with protein subunits that have been successful for both zoster and influenza. You know, as you know, in, in children, for example, there, there are vaccines that, that can work better. I suppose what we don't know there is if it's because they're naive, right, or, or if it's because they're children, and, unless you get to very young children with the polysaccharides, for example. So, um, so it, it's a great question, and it may well be that if we have multiple constructs, there will be formulations that are better for different age groups or risk groups. We also shouldn't forget that we're testing monoclonal antibodies. So, um, you know, could that be used for post-exposure prophylaxis for, for example, very debilitated elderly or perhaps immunocompromised who, who may not be able to mount an immune response to any of these vaccines? So, um, we're, we're running short on time here. Um, we have five more questions. Uh, it will be Bernstein, Fry, Lee. Uh, Bata and uh, Hayes. Um, so we'll begin uh, with Dr. Bernstein. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. This was clear and succinct. Uh, 
description of the multiple platforms to develop vaccines in such a compressed timeline. Uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful presentation. My question relates to some of the earlier ones, and I, I was just interested to know, thinking about how to establish adequate uh, sample sizes as you move through the phases of vaccine development and you want to use them in multiple populations, especially those at high risk. How are you establishing the number of subjects? Obviously, early ones are just going to be in the tens, but how are you establishing that for each of these multiple platforms for multiple populations? Yeah, so again, a really good question. Actually, the initial trials will probably be closer to 30,000. And part of the reason for that is, is of course, we're looking at it, attack rates, which are somewhat unpredictable. And also, we're looking at speed and, and timing. So as, as you know, we can either increase power by um, increasing sample size, or we can just have the trial go longer. And in a pandemic, we would prefer not to have the trial go longer. So um, I believe that these will be quite well-powered efficacy studies. Excellent. Dr. Fry? Thanks, Dr. Newsel. That was a great presentation. Uh, my question is quick, and it's for you or possibly the FDA. So we know that mouse models and non-human primate primate models are frequently used to study responses to experimental COVID vaccines, but I was wondering what is the best animal model for studying severe AEs to these vaccines, and do we really know? Thanks. Yeah, this is Kathy. I, I'm not sure I have an answer to that for COVID. I am not sure what I would use as the gold standard for that. If, if the gold standard is human disease and we don't quite understand human disease yet, uh, but perhaps um, the FDA has a, a more scientific answer. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Fink, please. Uh, hi. Um, so I, I'm not quite sure what you, you mean by severe um, AEs, uh, except uh, you know if, if what you mean is what we typically think of in terms of um, you know, severe injection site reactions or systemic uh, like pulmonary. So so you're you're talking about enhanced disease then, enhanced respiratory disease? Correct. Thank you. Right. Um, so uh, you know probably the the, the non human a non human primate model um, uh, based on uh, prior experiences with uh, with other coronavirus vaccines um, is is our our best model um, at this time. But uh, my understanding is that there um, there's been work more recently into other models. Um, uh, hamster model comes to mind, and, and again, I'm not the the, the expert on on animal models, but um, but uh, I, I do know that there is work uh, ongoing uh, to to identify and, and develop and characterize um, animal models that could uh, potentially serve uh, to evaluate potential for enhanced respiratory diseases. In the Dr. Fry, this is Amanda. We can try to give include a short update on um, animal models and studies in that space um, for the next uh, virtual ACIP meeting. Thank you. Ms. Bata. Um, thank you, and thank you, Dr. Nuzel, for um, a great presentation. Um, and this is to um, kind of go off of a couple of the other questions about um, the representation of um, persons with at-risk um, um, conditions for which we'd want to protect. Um, I, what what is being done to make sure that that the the um, cohorts that are being studied are representative of our, of our population. I, could you repeat that last part? I'm not sure I entirely followed it. Um, what, what is being done that um, to make sure that the cohorts that are being studied are representative of 
the population. And I'm thinking that in particular, um, our communities of color where we're seeing more severe um, disease or higher disproportionate amount of disease. Yes, thank you. I wanted to clarify the question I had answered earlier about the chronic diseases and the age. So yes, you are absolutely right. And I should have mentioned that as, as well, the, the recognition that um, Native Americans, um, African Americans, Hispanic populations are suffering disproportionate morbidity and mortality. Again, the rapid timeline is working against us because we know that, that trust is, is built over time and that we don't have a lot of time here. So what we're trying to do is capitalize on already established mechanisms to reach these communities. As Matt mentioned previously, you know, the CDC is involved in, in some of these committees in terms of outreach, in terms of identifying as quickly as possible the leaders of some of these minority um, communities so that they are well represented in these research efforts. Dr. Hayes. Yes, Ms. Bott, I just asked the question I wanted to ask. Thank you. All right, so um, we will uh, stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. Newsom.